Welcome, everyone. I'm Mary Ray, co-founder of my MS team, the largest and fastest growing social network for people with MS. Already one in nine people diagnosed with MS in the United States is a member. Worldwide, my MS team has more than 150,000 members that provide support and advice for each other. If you haven't checked it out already, please do so at mymsteam.com. We are very excited to have a full house today. Over 550 people pre-registered for tonight's event, and I'm even more excited to welcome back one of my favorite guests who has a great sense of humor, as you can see in the chat already, his own YouTube channel with over 350 videos covering a range of MS topics and an insightful video and article series on my MS team. Dr. Aaron Boster is here with us today. He's a neurology specialist focused on MS, and he's the president and founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, and of course, a great friend to us here at my MS team. Welcome back, Dr. Boster. Mary, it's awesome to be back. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. So have I, and actually all of us have. Something you said in our last um, two live events that continues to resonate with our audience is the importance of sharing with your doctor whatever you can relate, uh, whatever can be related to your MS, but what you call the up there's and the down there's that some people don't necessarily connect to MS, some of the more uh, embarrassing topics um, are, are also some things that are very important. And today we're gonna dig into these topics. And as usual, due to high demand, we're gonna provide a recording of this live event for those who are missing it. And by the way, we're doing another live event. So stay tuned at the end of this uh, session to get more details about that. So um, before we begin, by, by now, some of you already know my personal connection to MS is through my mother-in-law who lived with MS for over 30 years. Uh, but before we start, Dr. Boster, for those who don't know you, could you remind our aud audience of your personal connection? With pleasure. Um, I was a family member of someone impacted by MS decades before I learned about the pathophysiology or immunology of the disease. I actually don't remember a time when my uncle didn't have MS. I was 12 when I decided to become an MS doctor when I promised my mother and my grandmother that I would learn to do it better. And I've had a rather directed course. I was that weirdo in high school that said, I'm gonna be an MS doc. And it's become my mission to help people impacted by MS and to help families impacted by MS live their best lives despite this disease. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, ever since you mentioned that concept, again, I'll come back to this, the up there's and the down there's, uh, and how important it is to talk about it with your doctor. I can't help but think this is a reference for anyone to talk to their doctor about whether, whether they have MS or not. Can you give a brief overview for our audience of what I'm talking about? What are the three up there's and the three down there's? With pleasure. So much of multiple sclerosis is invisible. Everyone listening to this call has experienced the, honey, you look so good. Oh, you don't look sick. The majority of the pathology of MS is invisible to the casual observer. And a lot of it can be encapsulated in what I oftentimes refer to as the up there's and the down there's. So for me, when I reference the up there's, I'm talking about the triad of cognition, which is thinking and memory, mood, and energy levels. And these are some of the most commonly expressed symptoms by people impacted by MS. They're one of the leading causes of loss of work in multiple sclerosis, and yet they're completely invisible and honey, you look fantastic. And so I think checking in with a human that's surviving and thriving despite having MS and asking how they're doing with their mood, how they're doing with thinking and memory, what their energy is like is a requirement to make sure that we're doing our very best job caring for them. Likewise, the down there's are terribly important. And to your point earlier, sometimes they're a little bit culturally sensitive or a little bit taboo in some cultures, but really what I'm talking about are massive proponents of quality of life amongst adult humans, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And all too often when I bring up, how's your bladder? There's a pause because for the first time, somebody is asking them what's going on with their pee pee. And, and they're a bit taken aback, they're a bit scared and surprised. Oftentimes they're profoundly relieved that they can finally talk about the self, the fact that they have to wear a depend undergarment or they have to wear a pad all the time because they're wet. 
And when I, when I dig into it, sometimes nobody has ever brought that up to them and they didn't even know that it was related to their disease or that we could do something to fix it. And so I think it's very important that we address the up there's and the down there's with every single visit, every single interaction, it's a quick check, but it's so important. Fantastic. So just in summary, what I heard were when we think about the up there's cognition, energy, and mood. And we're thinking about the down there's we're talking bowel, bladder, and sexual function. So to, so to start, so that's just for those who are just joining us now, we are here with Dr. Boster. Um, Dr. Boster, in a survey that my MS team did back in 2018, over 443 members have participated in this survey and said that they began to experience cognitive impairment symptoms well before being officially diagnosed with MS. Does that surprise you? Nope, not even a little bit. When, when, we, when we look at um, someone who has clinically isolated syndrome, so the very first event that may go on to develop MS, and we study these folks, what we find is they already have evidence of accelerated brain volume loss. So their brains are already shrinking at a faster clip than what we would want. And when you do sensitive neuropsychometric testing, they manifest cognitive impairments. Cognitive impairments that are subtle at that point, but they're present. And so I'm not surprised by that, not at all. So one of, our, uh, one of our members had asked, why can't I keep a coherent thought? I can't remember doing things. What kind of cognitive issues affect people with MS? And if you can answer this, why? Sure. So the first thing I'd like to say, Mary, is that MS is not Alzheimer's dementia. So often my patient is petrified that their MS is gonna to lead to a place where they saw their grandfather who had an Alzheimer's dementia and didn't remember his loved ones or who he was and things like that. And that is simply not the situation with multiple sclerosis. The cognitive impairments, which unfortunately are very common, maybe 50 to 70% of people impacted by MS may experience cognitive impairments in some capacity are not like Alzheimer's dementia. It's typically what I refer to as prefrontal so the kind of problems that we see in cognition as it relates to MS are things such as difficulty with multitasking, difficulty with keeping lists in their head, difficulty with remembering a series of patterns. Very commonly, someone will tell me, Aaron, I didn't used to have to keep phone numbers written down because I knew everyone's phone number by heart. And now I can't find the list with all the phone numbers on it. And, and this deals with executive functioning and uh, prefrontal functioning. And that's the most common thing that we see. If you were to talk about one cognitive deficit in MS, the most common is what we call attention. So attention is our ability to lock on to a task. And I'll give you an example, all right? So we're gonna take a stereotypical husband and wife and the husband likes the foosball. And so it's Saturday and he's watching the foosball and She's in the other room trying to take care of the house. And she says, hey, bring me your dishes. And he says, Ugh. and then about five minutes later, the wife comes in the room and says, why didn't you bring the dishes? He didn't really attend, right? So he was so focused on the foosball that he heard noises, but he didn't really attend to what she had to say and he couldn't remember it. And then he gets in trouble because he didn't bring her the plate. Someone with MS may be looking at you, may be listening to you, they may be desperately trying to take in what you're saying, but they can't attend to the problem and, and therefore they can't remember. And that is the single most common thing that we see in the setting of multiple sclerosis. Got it. So, you know, um, I just wanna remind our audience, we have some great questions coming through here that, uh, if you have a question, please do use the Q&A feature and we have a team who's fielding some of our questions through here. And also a reminder that um, Dr. Boster will not be giving out specific medical advice. Um, however, we are gonna stick to the general topics of cognition, energy, and mood, as well as bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Um, you know, one social ties to friends, family work, um, work colleagues and even teachers can be import an important support system for people with MS who have experience with these sort of cognitive difficulties that you've pointed out, not to mention my MS team as a social tie, right? But that assumes you feel comfortable about being able to be open with your feelings um, and what you're going through. And some people don't even do this with their doctor. So what guidance do you have to make people more comfortable with broaching the topic about sharing perhaps 
issues around cognition, um, their memory health that might feel a little embarrassing to face head on? There's a couple of things that I would like folks uh, to keep in mind. Number one, it's treatable. There's a bunch of things that we can do to treat problems with thinking and memory in MS. And so the first thing I want folks to remember is the reason I want you to tell me about it is because I can make it better by helping you. All right. And that's a really big deal. The second thing that I want to comment on is there's no shame in that game. There's no shame in saying, hey, I'm having more trouble remembering stuff. I'm, I'm having more trouble at my job. And I, I want people to hear me. If you don't tell me that it's a problem, I can't help you make it better, right? So I need you to be an active member of your care, just like I want to be an active member of your care. And it's important that I create a safe space that I create an environment where I honor what you're saying. I'm respectful of what you're saying. I listen to what you're saying. And, and I treat it in a, a very delicate manner because it's a delicate, important topic. Um, it is, the, the onus is on me to create that environment. Uh, and, and it's my sincere hope that, that, that we all do that. And I wanna convey to you that, that I can help you make it better. And that together by working through it, we can really navigate. And where we end up is oftentimes pretty fantastic. Can we role play for a second? I just wanna kind of like, I'm the doctor and okay. you are gonna to talk to me about some cognitive issues, some lapses that you've experienced. Um, we're talking, you know, we're saying, you know, how's it been going? Is it generally kind of open up? How are you doing? I'm pretty what good. I can't really complain, thanks. <laughs> That's a typical answer, isn't it? That's what you hear often in your own practice, I'm sure. So what I always say is, are, is that a socially polite good or are you actually really good? And nine times out of 10, they say, actually, I'm doing really And I'll say, okay, let's start there. Because it's, it's a, um, oftentimes when you say, how are you doing? The person asking the question doesn't actually care how you're doing. They're, they're just saying hello in a polite manner. But when, when I, as a physician in my clinic room, say, how are you doing? I'm not asking casually. I'm, I'm, I really want to know how you're doing. So how should our audience here answer that question and understand that's not a polite, social polite? What should, if cognitions, bear with me here, top of mind as an issue, what should I say? What sh would you say? Step one is I want you to write down your concerns on a piece of paper because you can get flabbergasted and, and you can get um, befuddled in front of the doctor and you may have a momentary lapse and not remember. So I want you to write it down. That's your security that if you happen not to remember, you can just refer to it. That's the first thing. The second thing is when the doctor says, how are you doing? I want you to say, honestly, doc, I'm not doing very well. Mm. And then just pause and let the doctor say, tell me more. But I want you to start off recognizing that the clinic environment, although it feels like it should sometimes feel like a casual conversation, it's not. And that is a holy time for me when I'm trying to help you be the most awesome version of you possible despite having MS. And I need you to be honest with me. I mean, sometimes I only have a half an hour to talk to you. That's not a lot of time. So we have to dig in quickly and get to the bottom of what's really bothering you. And when I say, how are you doing? I, I really want you to honestly say, I, I'm not doing very well today. Got it. We have one member who wrote in saying that her cognition health had been declining for about five years and now she's not able to work. What could she do to slow down that decline? Pick a number between two through 10. Three. All right, let's do three things that she could do to decrease the decline. Right. One of them is to exercise as part of her lifestyle. Exercise has been demonstrated to improve energy levels and improve mood, which indirectly help cognition. And exercise has been demonstrated to literally improve thinking and memory in multiple sclerosis. And so you can actually up your thinking and memory game by exercising as part of your lifestyle. So that's a really important pro tip that I, I sometimes think people ignore or overlook. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they can look at their list of medications and streamline polypharmacy. So polypharmacy is a doctor term for, man, I have you on way too many medicines. What am I doing? And doctors, particularly allopathic doctors like myself are awesome at giving medicines. 
we're not very awesome at taking away medicines. And mm. sometimes you can end up on a laundry list of meds which have the risk of clouding the sensorium and it's happened so slowly over so long that you don't even realize it. So okay, can- so just, I'm gonna just rewind for a second. Uh, we'll put a little footnote, clouding the sensorium. Can you just? Yes, so clouding the sensorium is my way of saying medicines that make it so that you have trouble taking in your surroundings, you kind of feel fuzzy headed, um, you know, you're kind of out of it. Uh, there's a, a host of medicines that help with pain, spasticity, um, bladder. There's a host of medicines that are super awesome for, for various symptoms, but they can make you have foggy thinking. And so that's what I mean when I say you, the second thing that we can do after exercise is we can look at our medication list with our doctor and say, hey doc, which of these meds can I cut in half? Which of these meds do I not need? Which of these meds are a requirement? And I want to have a, a smaller medication list. Moreover, I would challenge everyone listening. If the doctor it asks you to start a new med, say, no problem. Which one are you going to take away? Mm. Challenge That's, the doctor. I want to pause there for a second. If everyone, if you didn't hear this, because I know there are a lot of questions about medication and treatment and what to do and whatnot. That is such an important insight right there. If this polypharma concept and this idea that if someone's adding yet another to also ask what to take away, have you had many patients have the confidence to say something like that? Um, Yes, I I have had patients um, who say, hey, that's that's a lot. Can we get rid of one? But I I ask my patients to challenge me. Mm. I, I ask them, say, well, each time I talk to you, if I ever add a med, challenge me to remove one. Um, I'm, I'm asking them to be an active participant. And sometimes at the end of a visit, I'll say, okay, let's attack your medication list. And we'll, we'll look through the medicines. And sometimes we conclude that you need every single one of them. But sometimes we find one that we can cut in half or take off. Mm-hmm. That is a really powerful way of improving thinking and memory, I think. Got it. There's, there's a, um, this is great because you answered like yet another question. So I'm not going to ask the next question about um, additional treatments and what have you, but there's this important question that's been, been a theme recent in, in, in just this live chat right now too, is what connections are there between the up there's and down there's, or particularly up there, excuse me, with things like anxiety, depression, OCD. So so when, again, when I think of the up there's, I'm thinking about the triad of energy, thinking and memory and mood. And they are tied together with a ribbon really tightly. If you impact one, it will have an effect on the others. There was actually a paper in the medical literature that came out a couple of weeks ago that stated that. And I was reading it and said, yeah. And if you have anxiety, it will make it harder to think clearly. If you are profoundly exhausted, it will make it harder to think clearly. If we can work on your anxiety, it will improve your cognition. The flip is also true. If I can help your cognition, it will improve your mood. And I, you know, I, I state this having done MS neurology for 15 years now, and I see it time and time again. Those three symptoms are a triad. They're, they're, they're linked together very tightly. And you can't impact one without impacting another. Is it common? I'm, we're about to go to a poll question here because we're gonna we're gonna slowly shift to the other to the down there's. But before we do that, is it common for you to um, confer? This is just a question coming from a patient perspective, of course. But to confer with other um, folks, other providers that uh, your patients seeing related to mental health. So I'm just thinking if somebody is on medication to treat the depression or anxiety and what have you. And they're also, I'm talking about play farm, they're also dealing with a lot of meds on MS. What is that process like, or how can a patient bridge those conversations together? Because you know what they, they are on. You, you have your, you, your EHR, you have your, your, your system, right? Um, but could, could you sh- shed some light on that for the audience? Yeah. So nobody gets to have MS by themselves. Um, here we are uh, talking together with my MS team. What an awesome name for an awesome organization, which creates an opportunity to, to, to help you find your village. And every person uh, thriving despite having MS needs to have a village. And doctors want to be village members. I want to be your village member. I want to help and participate. And I'm not the only doctor that you see probably. 
And so we have to treat ourselves as a village. And one of the things that is obligated, in my opinion, is that when I write a note, I send a copy to my patient. The, the, the medical note that I write, I mail it to the patient or I make it available electronically to the patient because they need to see what I said and they need to have a copy to take to their primary care doctor, to take their gastroenterologist, to take to their urologist, whomever. I also feel like I am obligated to send letters to all of those people. So I call it the circle of care. And when I write a letter, I want to craft it in a way and share it with your entire village. Now, if the urologist or the orthopedic surgeon doesn't want to read the neurologist letter, okay. But, but I think it's important to share. And likewise, it is my request that my patient have all of their clinicians send me copies of their correspondence. The other thing that I do is, is I make my cell phone and my email available to my patient with instructions to give it to all of their providers. Mm. So I want their primary care doctor to have my cell phone on speed dial. So if they need me, they can call me. This is nothing more than bringing people together with a common goal of making you the most awesome you possible. And I don't think we can do it in silos. Now, the patient can be their own advocate and they can say, I need you to call my GI guy because he's telling me something different than what you're telling me. And I need the two of you to talk. And the doctor should say, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon that when I finish my clinic day, I have a couple phone calls to make to various team members of my patients so that we can confer and get on the same page. I'll give you a very quick example. A patient of mine uh, with pretty bad MS who has Crohn's disease and lupus. And she's on a medicine that treats her MS and her lupus. But now her Crohn's disease is acting up. So I have a medicine I want to switch her to, which will treat MS and Crohn's disease, but it'll leave the lupus out. So I've got to have a three-way combo with the GI guy, the rheumatologist, and me, so we can sort out what we're going to do. Got it. That's great. I mean, that's 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 wonderful to hear that and how, how lucky a patient she is to have you. I want to go to our poll question. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this, you know, it's super easy. We're going to have this poll question show up, and all you have to do is answer it, uh, and we'll share, share the results. So what down there issue frustrates you the most? And as people are answering this, uh, you know, just thinking about cognition and, and other challenges um, related to up there's and down there's. What about dealing with MS symptoms in cold weather? Yeah, so, so you know, I live in sunny Columbus, Ohio, uh, and I've been enjoying shoveling and scraping ice off my car in the morning. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the, the, the folks that live in the Midwest, uh, you know, we're experiencing that cold weather that you just referenced. And there's a lot of changes that we can see in the setting of cold weather. Now, the obvious one, which is outside the scope of today's chit chat is spasticity, which gets worse. You get tighter, stiffer, you have more cramps in the cold. But, but when there's cold weather in Ohio, there's also gray darkness because it's now getting dark really early, like 5 p.m. at night, 6 p.m. at night. And it's dark when you go into work in the morning. And so as it relates to the up there's, to energy levels, to thinking and memory, and to some extent cognition, the winter doldrums are upon us. Mm -hmm. And we have to do things to fight back. Uh, I commonly ask my patients to buy those SAD lights, the seasonal affective disorder lights, yeah. so they can yeah. and soak in some, some equivalent of sun um, during these rough months. Got it. That's great. Well, we have our poll results. Thank you for, for talking about the weather impact on our up there's, but let's talk about the down there's. What is everyone saying? Okay. Right now it's incontinence has topped the list followed by low libido, sexual dysfunction or pain, lack of sensation and uh, constipation. Uh, so does this, this is our, of our, of our audience watching here. It, does this sort of resonate with what you're seeing among your, your client, your, your patients in your practice? Yes. Uh, I think that bladder is something, you know, we pee multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bladder problem, you're going to be reminded of it each time you go to try to empty. Um, we don't have sex several times a day, or at least um, not in my neck of the world. Uh, and, and so we don't have occasion to, to recognize that we have erectile dysfunction or no sensation or dryness or inability to achieve orgasm as frequently. And so I think just by virtue of living life, if you're having trouble with peeing, 
you're going to notice it very, very often and very frequently. Uh, we, we saw that there's constipation on that list and constipation is a very, very common symptom in MS. Um, but no, but I'm not surprised by that list at all. Now, just real quick, I know that we're shifting gears, but Fire Tablet brought up a really important point. Um, Fire Tablet said, well, what's the, third, what's the third thing for the up there? Remember, you picked three and we only did two. So just very quickly so that I can feel complete. Otherwise, I would be trying to find Fire Tablet online so I can- Yes, answer. yes, let's, let's do that. Um, the third thing that I'll talk about um, is, is having structure to your life. The more structure that you create for your life, the more routines that you have, the better you'll be. And I'll use an example of my medicine and my keys. So every morning, my family used to laugh because I'd leave to go to work and I'd go to my car and I don't have any keys and I'd run back in the house. And then I'd run around the house like a crazy man trying to find my keys because I was going to be late to clinic. Until finally, I decided that I only put my keys in one location. So there's one spot in my house and that's where my keys go. And if my family sees they're not there, they put them there. And ever since I've done that, I've never been late to clinic for lack of finding keys because I always go to that same spot. Another example is taking medicine. So it's hard to remember to take medicine, or at least for me it is. And so I link taking medicine to something that I always do. I always drink coffee when I wake up in the morning. My home could be burning down and I would make a cup of coffee and drink it and then I would try to put the fire out. And so what I like to do is I put my medicine on my coffee maker. So every morning when I go to get coffee, I say, oh, oh, there's medicine there. And then I take it. By creating structure and linking things together, you can't forget them. And it helps a tremendous amount. And you can extend it far reaching into your life. So um, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. Create a system around yourself when you as a person can't really do it, have the system and scaffolding around you to do it. Great yeah. idea. Um, well, you mentioned uh, we sex was on there as well. Does sexual dysfunction? So let's just get right into it. Does having MS affect sex drive? We're talking libido and why? So it can. Um, when I think about uh, sexual function for a gentleman, I think about arousal, libido. I think about obtaining, maintaining an erection, and ejaculating. So those are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in exploring. For a lady, if we're talking about sexual uh, function, I'm thinking about arousal, libido, lubrication, which is the biological equivalent of erection and orgasm. So those are, those are the topics at hand. And there's multiple different reasons why someone would have a low libido. Now, to frame this discussion, Mary, I want to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary sexual dysfunction. And I find these concepts extremely helpful when talking about getting it on. So primary sexual dysfunction is where the circuitry of sex is damaged. So the brain and spinal cord have taken a hit from the MS and the circuitry of sex, the, the, uh, the electrical systems that create erection, create arousal have, have been damaged. Secondary sexual dysfunction is when symptoms of MS make it hard to be sexy. For example, we, we saw that 37% uh, of the respondents commented on incontinence. If you're having sex and you wet yourself, that's not very sexy and that will, that will stop the activity. Or if you're nervous that you might be incontinent of your urine, you may not engage in intercourse just for fear that that may happen. And that's an example of secondary sexual dysfunction. Another example would be spasticity. If you're having sex and your leg goes into an extensor spasm, you're not having sex anymore. You're grabbing your leg and rocking and trying to get the pain to stop. Now, tertiary sexual dysfunction is a psychological phenomenon where we just don't feel like a sexy beast. We, we, we feel like, um, like we're ill and we just don't feel like a sexy entity. And all three of them can contribute to a lack of libido for different reasons, obviously. And so when I'm trying to tackle libido, I'm looking into those things. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there are two things I want to, I want to drill home here. So the, going, going back to um, the primary, and then also there's going to be managing interpersonal relationships around it. So let me just go for the first part. Okay. Um, it's common to get numb down there, lose sensation. I think that's related to the primary that we were talking about um, where, where, it affects or having an orgasm. We have a, um, a participant in this, this event right now who says they're also post menopausal and have dryness and they wanna be able to address that. Um, is there any, any guidance you can provide there? I mean, because obviously we're talking about this, but, but what would you say about that? 
Absolutely. So I'm going to teach you a very powerful tool. I call it the vibrator trick. So step one is to purchase a water-based lubricant, right? Why? A water-based lubricant increases skin sensitivity. And so it helps increase your skin's ability to receive stimulus. Now, step two is a very important step and it involves a plug in the wall vibrator and allow me to explain. Right now, as I talk to you, Mary, I'm using my indoor voice. I'm not screaming and yelling. I'm just speaking normally. And you can hear me fine because there's very little interference between my mouth and my mic and your speaker in your ear. But if we had all 550 people that signed up for this in one room, the, the ambient noise would be so loud that me talking with my indoor voice wouldn't cut it because you wouldn't be able to hear me because there's too much interference between my mouth and your ear. So I would have to increase the intensity of my voice and I'd have to talk really loud so that you could hear me. We can have the exact same problem with intercourse because of primary sexual dysfunction. The, when, when you stimulate the down there's, the message has to go all the way up the spinal cord to the brain where the brain's like, oh, oh, that's what we're doing. Okay, okay. And then it has to send a message all the way back down to create adequate lubrication or erection or what have you. And not uncommonly in the setting of MS with spinal cord damage or brain damage, the message dies along the way. So we use a water-based lubricant and then we use a plug in the wall vibrator. Now I am a big proponent of the Hitachi magic wand. I don't have a kickback. I don't, I don't work for them. Um, it's not a Stark violation. I just really like the product and I think they're amazing. A Hitachi magic wand is a plug in the wall vibrator. Like I'm talking like hardcore DC power, right? And my recommendation is bring this into the bedroom. You can use the water-based lubricant and the plug in the wall vibrator by yourself. You can use it during, uh, during intercourse. You can put it between you and your partner. You can use it on your own. You can use it afterwards. There's a host of things you can do. So a, a gentleman can put it on the head of the penis, the shaft of the penis, under the testicles. A woman can put it on the clitoris or somewhere else in the vulva. And oftentimes it can provide what I refer to as overdrive stimulation. It's about 50 bucks. And I will tell you that 80, 90% of the time, the patient comes back with a big thumbs up and the spouse comes back with a big thumbs up because it was able to overcome the, the interference. Now, Thank you. That's, that's a great analogy, actually, with regard to volume and, and what we're talking about here. And um, I appreciate you disclosing the fact that you have no kickback there. Um, now well, we're going to go. <laughs> before we move on, just another thing about vaginal dryness. Mm. Is that it, we, have a pay, we have someone that responded that they're postmenopausal. And, yes. and so as a result, there can be less local estrogen. Talking to your doctor, whether that be your neurologist or your OB-GYN, we can prescribe estrogen cream. Estrogen cream is awesome sauce because it, rubbing it on the vulva, you can, you can increase the vascularity of the tissue, you can increase the, 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 um, the ability to become lubricated, but you're not exposing the whole body to high levels of estrogen, which can be associated with some bad things. So it's a really important thing to bring up. And if you just tell your OB-GYN or your primary care doctor or your very well-attuned neurologist, hey, I've got vaginal dryness and postmenopausal, we can prescribe some estrogen cream. Because it's, lo it's, it's localized, a localized treatment, basically. That's great. And I, I appreciate it. Thank you for that. And um, so those are sort of the mechanics of things. This next question, you're not a, a mar uh, marriage therapist. You're not a relationship therapist. Um, I'm still going to, lob this over anyway and see if you have any insight and, and we can move on from there. But the, the, there are a couple of questions that are coming in around managing a spouse with high libido when you have low libido. Do you have guidance for relationship, for relationships when the MS patient has that situation and how can they, uh, I mean, again, we went over the mechanics of things that they might be able to address, but maybe in having the conversations. This is um, extremely common, very, very common. Uh, and um, I, I do think that it's very important to address it. So the, the number one thing is we need to have open dialogue about sex. So you and your partner need to have a dialogue where they say, I'm not getting late enough. And you say, yeah, but I hurt and I'm tired. And, and, you, and you, you have an, a discussion. Now, if we clarify that one partner has a sex drive much higher than the other partner, there's ways of addressing that. For example... Maybe 
once a week they have vaginal intercourse. Maybe once a week they participate in manual stimulation. Maybe once a week they uh, mutually masturbate next to each other. My, my, my point is we're, we're having an adult conversation about two consenting adults trying to game out how they can enjoy the bedroom. And it doesn't mean that you always have to have sex. You might be able to make sure that your partner is satisfied and that your needs are met without having to engage in classic missionary intercourse. And so that's not a conversation that you can have if you don't talk about it. And so I think getting to the bottom of what's driving, you know, what, what's going on? What, what's, why do you keep asking me this? Very often I'll have a situation where, and I'll use an example where the patient is the wife and the husband is in the room, just as an example. Very often the wife will disclose, I have spasms of my vagina and it hurts like the Dickens, or I have, I have pain. It feels like I'm on fire. And the husband doesn't know that he's unaware. And he says, Oh my God, honey, why didn't you tell me? Oh, I was uncomfortable. And so in the clinic room, they're starting to discover that by talking, they didn't understand. The patient didn't understand and the, the spouse didn't understand. And so having those conversations is the starting point to making it better. That's great. And we did have a question that somebody had asked about pain in the clitoris and even numbness. And I will say that a key point I think all of our audience should, should take note of here is um, reinforcing this point, how important it is to talk to your doctor because then they can have the language and be informed a better informed in how to talk to their partner at home who may not understand. And that partner may be even more open-minded to what is going on physically and mechanically uh, as it's related to the condition. So thank you for sharing that. Um, now to that specific question, someone had one member told us that numbness around the clitoris actually made sex painful. Were some of the mechanics that you had talked about with estrogen cream, water-based lubricants, um, are those the sorts of things that can help that? Or is that something else going on related to MS? It, it's, it's not clear based on the question, but it could be something um, in addition. For example, um, people impacted by MS can develop, um, it's called paresthesias and dysesthesias. Those are doctor words for numbness and tingling and painful sensations. And you can have them in your hand, you can have them in your face, you can have them in your penis, you can have them in your vulva. I mean, it can be in the down there's. And the same medicines that help neuropathic pain in your face will help neuropathic pain in your groin. And so identifying, hey, this hurts, it's, 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 a, it's a painful sensation, allows us then to explore opportunities to treat it. Uh, and there's a lot that we, there's a lot that we can do. Um, there's numbing creams, there's uh, neuropathic pain medicines, there's a host of things that we can do um, to help. Uh, one tip that we haven't talked about yet, but it's so very important. And so if you guys weren't listening to what I was saying, I'd ask you to start listening right now. Pelvic floor physical therapy is a best kept secret in the MS clinic. And a pelvic floor physical therapist can change your world in a way that you didn't think was possible. Uh, they oftentimes, I, I, it's kind of like uh, physical therapy for bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And they, the pelvic floor physical therapist that I use uh, the most likes to tell people, hey, listen, I'm going to get up in your business. She puts you up in stirrups. She gets up in your business. And she helps retrain the pelvic floor. Oftentimes, people have a disuse phenomenon where the pelvic muscles have atrophied and they can no longer activate them adequately or they're having horrible pain and spasms and it's contributing to a lot of pain. And time and time again, when you visit the pelvic floor physical therapist, it's like the sky opens up and the birds sing and, you know, and, and there's rainbows. I mean, it's, it's a really, really big deal. And so if you are struggling with bowel bladder or sexual dysfunction and you have yet to see a pelvic floor physical therapist, I strongly encourage that you do so. It'll change your life. Thank you for sharing that. I know that a lot of women who have had, cheers, yeah, who, I know a lot of women who have had babies, uh, who've had, who've gone through vaginal delivery have challenges with that. And so this isn't going to be a foreign concept to them around pelvic floor kind of rehabilitation and incontinence actually, you know, you might hear that. And, and I think probably our audience might, might, that might resonate with them when you, know, you first have the baby and, and you're laughing, you're like, wait a minute, 
something else is happening for a second there. So pelvic floor exercises, when we think about Kegels, that's, those are some of the exercises that, that, that um, professional might help you with. Pelvic floor physical therapist will make Kegels seem like child's play. I mean, it's kicking it up like six levels uh, and, and it's really, really cool. That's great. Well, we're going to go to, um, so that's really cool. I love the positive, positive note on that front. We're going to go to our next poll question and it's more along the lines of, um, what, what is bringing you joy right now during this pandemic, during COVID? Um, here are some options here. So if you can go ahead and, and answer that, um, what about you, Dr. Boster? What, what are you doing to kind of, not necessarily, I mean, relax, recharge, uh, bring joy? So uh, anytime that I'm able to spend with uh, my family is a, a really important time to me. Uh, I also need some downtime where I decompress. Um, and I spend a lot of time on YouTube educating myself on things that I don't do on a daily basis. Um, that's a real fun thing for me. So I, I, I spend a lot of time there uh, and it's a nice relaxation. The biggest thing that I do almost on a, on a nightly basis, almost all year round, is I sit out by my outdoor fireplace uh, and until it's below zero, I'll be out there every night uh, burning logs and just sitting with my dog and relaxing, watching the fire. Um, to me, that's really uh, one of the most important mental health things that I do. Wonderful. That's great. Um, <laughs> I will say I, I had uh, some delightful satisfaction in using a snake to unclog a sink. And I just was so gratified by that. So just a little something about me. All right, so going back, here are the poll results. I think they're up here, here we go. Ah, a lot of media, yeah, con consuming content, basically. Listen to some music, reading books, watching movies. Got it. And getting outside, you have some folks who are joining you in that camp there too, fantastic. Great. Well, we're going to go into the next question here. A member wrote in, uh, we'll, we'll say on the incontinence, my incontinence has been so severe that I now have no control. How common is incontinence with MS? What causes it? And besides, um, what, you know, what can people do, up, do about it? We had talked about the pel pelvic floor therapist. What, what else can they do? The, the bladder is a really interesting animal. And, and really, we, I divide the bladder function neurologically into two categories. The bladder is a bag that holds urine. And so it has to be able to fill up with urine. And one of the common problems in MS is that that bladder spasms down into a tight little racquetball. And you drink half a Coca-Cola and it's full. And now you're having frequency where you're running to the bathroom. You're having urgency where move out of the way. Mom's going to pee right now then you're having episodes of incontinence. You can also have nocturia where you're waking up at night to go potty. The other problem is not the bladder, but the outflow. So you have the urethra, which goes from the bladder to the outside world. That's where you pee. And the urethra is a smooth muscle and it can contract. And so you can have a normal bladder that's full of urine, but you're trying to push it out through the equivalent of like a swizzle straw and you can't get the urine out. And in that case, you'll have urinary retention. You'll have double voiding where you pee, stand up, ah, you sit back down and pee again. You'll dribble. And what can happen over time is it fills up so big, the bladder does, that it finally overcomes the, the, the bladder neck. And then you completely empty your bladder in a surprise. Now, MS can be very complicated because you can actually have both problems at the same time. And that's called dyssynergy. Mm -hmm. And so when we're trying to treat MS bladder, we have to try to parse out those elements based on uh, history. And oftentimes we'll use a bladder ultrasound machine to help figure out how they're voiding. And then based on that information, there's one set of drugs for a tight little racquetball bladder. There's another set of drugs for the bladder neck. And sometimes we need to use both. Now, the, the person shares that they're completely incontinent of urine. Uh, and, and that's an unfortunate situation that we can find ourselves in. There's a, there's a lot of options for what to do about that. Uh, and we're going to need the help of an expert urologist, but there are options such as bladder stimulators and make sure they're MRI compatible, please. There are options such as suprapubic catheters. There's even options where they connect the bladder and the bowel so that it drains directly into the bowel. So there's a lot of different things that can be done to help keep people not wet. Yeah, that's great. And sort of related to this topic, it's crossing a little bit over, well... Urinary tract infections 
are they more common among those with MS? It certainly feels like it. Uh, you know, when you, okay. it's not uncommon that people impacted by MS can have bladder problems. And if you, if the bladder neck is tight and you can't get the urine out, you're keeping bladder full of urine. Now, as an experiment, if you peed into a cup and left it at your, at your table, it would grow bacteria. It would smell and stink and, and it would fester. And if you can't empty your bladder, the same darn thing happens. And so urinary tract infections are all too common. And oftentimes they can trigger uh, what we call a pseudo exacerbation or a pseudo attack where in the setting of a minor UTI, your old optic neuritis comes back out or your, your clumsiness gets in more intensified. Some patients, they don't even know they're having a UTI. They just know their neuro symptoms are worse. And we do a urine dipstick and we say, ah, look, you've got a UTI. I probably treated five UTIs in clinic today. Five. That's a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised just from some, some anecdotal uh, conversations I've had with people I know with MS. Um, so constipation. It is a real issue. We saw the survey responses here. Obviously incontinence was huge is at the top of the list, but why is that such an issue? And what can, what can folks do about it? Unfortunately, one of the uh, uncommonly discussed symptoms of MS is slow gut transit. So literally you're moving, you know, stool through your gut slower. Uh, and and constipation can become a really big problem. Now, we can worsen constipation by giving you a bunch of medicines that can make you more constipated. Medicines for your bladder, medicines for thinking, medicines for, for depression. There's a host of medicines that will contribute to constipation. Uh, you know, I have a, a, a YouTube video where I think I listed like 66 contributors to constipation or some really high number because I just kept thinking of more and more things that could contribute to constipation. If we talk about a couple really, really key ones, the number one thing that I see that people can do to improve their ability to poop is up their water game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I always talk about the MS water challenge. When I drink, you drink. So let's all try that right now. If you got a beverage at home. Let's drink some up. water. Because very commonly, someone will shy away from water because of their lifestyle or because they don't want to be wet. And, they, and, and they're really, really dehydrated. And that makes their stool really, really dehydrated. So step one is to up your water game. I challenge people listening right now, drink one glass of water with each of your three meals. So glass of water with breakfast, glass of water with lunch, glass of water with dinner. Then drink one glass of water between breakfast and lunch. Not a big deal. You got like four hours, just drink one glass of water. Then drink one glass of water between lunch and dinner. Also not hard to do. If you do that, you've upped your water game substantially and you're gonna notice a difference in your ability to poop. Now, step two is to add fiber. So fiber are indigestible solids like sawdust. And so you could eat sawdust. Now, if you ate sawdust and didn't add water, it would turn your stool into like cement, which is a bad idea. But if you add water to sawdust, it expands like a sponge and it helps make the stool bulky and soft and easy to hold on to and easy to pass. Now, the best way to do fiber, in my opinion, is through foods. And so apples, pears, and prunes are the jam uh, because they're super high in fiber content and they're super high in water content and they're super high in sorbitol, which is a sugar that also helps with moving your bowels. Can, now, I, um, can I test a recipe with you really quick? All right, tablespoon of applesauce, a tablespoon of prune juice, and a tablespoon of a fiber cereal. So I like it, but I would rather you actually eat the apple because the apple oh, sauce, okay. the apple sauce has a tremendous amount of the fiber removed from it. The prune juice has a tremendous amount of the fiber removed from it. So I would much prefer that you eat a prune mm -hmm. than I would you drink prune juice. I would much, much prefer that you eat an apple than you have apple sauce or apple juice because what they take out when you make apple juice, they take the fiber out. Got it. Now, you know, some of us, we can't eat enough broccoli or, or apples to help. And so you can buy Metamucil, FiberCon, you know, any of these uh, over, over the counter products. You know, there's an entire aisle in the, in the supermarket called I Can't Poop. And it's got <laughs> a host of fiber products there. So, Is that what they call it in Ohio? What, what else could it be found? <laughs> Um, it, it actually isn't labeled as such, but that's what it is. The whole yeah. stuff to help you go potty. 
And, and if you simply up your water game and add fiber, that's going to make a big difference. Now, in the spirit of coming up with three suggestions for no particular reason. Sure, sure, let's do it. The third option, if your ambulatory is to walk more, the more exercise you do, the more you get your gut moving and the easier it's going to be to move your bowels. Now, now I lied because I want to add a fourth one in. And I want to talk about something very important called the gastrocolic reflex. When you put a hot beverage, not this water, but a hot beverage in your stomach or and when you put food in your stomach, about 20 to 30 minutes later, your, your bowels try to poop. The stimulation to your gut, gastric, triggers the colon, gastrocolic reflex. Now in the setting of MS, you may lose that feedback and you may not feel like you need to go, but your body is trying to go. So the best time to have a successful bowel movement is about a half an hour after your morning coffee or a half an hour after your lunch or a half an hour after your dinner. That's the prime time to move your bowels. Got it. Um, we have some questions coming in right now. How do you determine when it's an MS thing versus something like a neuro neurogenic bladder or IBS thing? So you, you bring up a really good point that human beings are not books, they're humans. And the human being doesn't have a MS problem. They have, they experience a symptom. So you experience a symptom of I'm really having trouble pooping. You don't know why you're having mm -hmm. trouble pooping. It could be because of MS. It could be because of a multitude of other things. This is where your team member, your village member, your doc can really help out. See, you know more about you than anyone. You're a you expert. I read books you didn't read, which does not make me smarter or better than you. It just means I read things you didn't read. And so if you can share with me your you experience, I can share with you stuff I read that may help. And then together as a team, we can make you poop. And so it's all predicated not on doctor Googling it and trying to figure it out on your own, but just telling your doc, hey, by the way, I poop once a week and it hurts. Janet. There is a, there was one question about going back to incontinence around Botox injections I act, that actually had crossed my mind as well. I'm not sure if that's better at, answered by urologist or what have you, but do you, do you want to address it? Sure. Absolutely. Great. So remember how I said you can have a tight little racquetball bladder? Yes. So you can Botox that bladder and get it to relax. Uh, and so it can fill up with a normal capacity. Uh, it is a powerful tool that I adore. Uh, the, one of the nice things is you only need to have it done every three months. Mm. So you go in every three or four months and they do a bladder Botox and then you're good in the hood. Now, one uh, very common side effect of bladder Botox is that you can't get the urine out on your own and you may need to use a catheter. And everybody mm. on the call just said, whoa. Yeah. But let me share with you from uh, years of experience helping people impacted by MS. When you learn how to self catheterize, it's empowering. And I have um, a, a wonderful patient of mine who I absolutely adore that was kind enough to write an essay on this topic. And what she shared was she used to live in fear of leaving her home. She wouldn't go very far because she would wet herself and she needed to know where every bathroom was and she would try to avoid fluids all day long. And, and all she was ever thinking about was, I'm gonna pee, I'm gonna pee. And it really degraded the quality of her life. We tried medicines, it didn't work. We tried various things. Finally, she got some bladder Botox and she has to self-catheterize. And she says in exchange for putting a catheter in her hoo-ha, she is able with impunity to do anything she wants, go anywhere she wants, never worry. She can go swimming. She can go to the mall. She can go to dinner. It's empowering to her. And she shares, it turns out to be very, very simple to self-catheterize. She also shared a pro tip that the very best place when you're out and about is the bathroom at Starbucks because they're private, they're, they're individual and the door locks and they're super clean. And so when she's out and about, that's her pro tip. That's where she likes to go. Yeah. And I guess we probably, I would probably have to get that pro tip updated because in places where we're sheltering in place, right? Like a lot of these places are not open for that. So um, and this, this might even be an interesting option um, to think about. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. We're going to go to our final poll question. And it's about our audience's thoughts on, on COVID. Given what you know now, what approach are you, are you taking to the COVID vaccine? I don't know, for those who had joined a little bit um, later, uh, Dr. Dr. Boster, you had mentioned that the FDA had uh, recommended uh, approval 
of their vaccine, of, of the COVID vaccine. So, so this is quite we, timely, isn't it? While we were prepping this call, I just got the notice that the FDA uh, advisory committee, so not the full FDA, but the advisory committee, advisory committee. reviewed the data for, the, for one of the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, which is up first for review, and by 77%, they accepted it, saying that the benefits outweighed the risk. And so I am beyond overjoyed at that result. That's a really, really big deal. And it's going to herald in a, uh, a new post-COVID era. I'm, I'm super thrilled. That's fantastic. All right. So what are the results, folks? Let's see what we have answered as a group. Oh, okay. Get yeah, vaccine as soon as but 33%. And, but most people had said, wait and see. Yeah, uh, that's really sad. Yeah. Um, interesting. So, well, Dr. Bosser, you've already helped inform some of the MS specific COVID content on my MS team. Can you give us what's known so far about the vaccine and MS and seeing the answers here from the audience? I think it's appropriate that we really get right to it. Thank you. Uh, now, first of all, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a virologist. I don't make vaccines for a living, but I care a whole bunch about this and I've done a lot of reading on it and I am um, actively working towards trying to keep my patients safe. So, so please take all those caveats into consideration. And by the way, the guy that likes my tie, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, so the first thing that we have to think about is what does a vaccine do? Or what is a vaccine? Because a lot of people aren't exactly familiar with a vaccine. What you're doing with a vaccine is you're showing your body little pieces of, uh, of, a, of a foreign invader. Like you take a virus and you mash it up in a blender and then you inject it into your skin and you show your immune system portions or parts of that virus. It's dead. And then your immune system builds an arsenal against those pieces and parts. And so then you, you have developed an immunity. We have cultivated an immunity against that viral or that bacterial uh, invader before you actually see it. So then later, when you come in contact with it, your immune system is already primed to jump on it, kill it, and clear it. That's, that's the concept of a vaccine. Now, up until like a month ago, no one in the world had ever been successful creating a coronavirus vaccine. Keep in mind that COVID-19 is not the first coronavirus. There's hundreds upon hundreds of coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are older than humans, but this novel coronavirus uh, with a high mortality is really something horrible. And we've never been able to make a coronavirus vaccine. And we were not successful in making a protein vaccine the way that I described. There are some amazing scientists. There's a gal, and I think she's in Turkey, who who really heralded in this new, uh, this new concept of an mRNA vaccine. Now, just to go back to college for a quick second, you have DNA, which is like the blueprint for making people, right? And then from DNA, you make a sub blueprint called RNA. And then from RNA, you make protein. And what we figured out was really, really cool because we couldn't make the protein for our immune system to see, we could make RNA and when you inject RNA into the human, their body makes the protein of the, of the M spike of the virus. Now you're not making the virus, you're just making a small piece of protein from the virus. Then your immune system can see that and it can build an arsenal against it, which is freaking brilliant. You know, I, I am um, a pro-vaxxer uh, because science, uh, because medicine, and, and we have cured horrible diseases that have ravaged the world. You know, we, we forget that there were conditions that wiped out a third of the earth and we've now eradicated them off the face of the earth because of vaccines. And the reason that I said I was feeling really sad when I saw the very, um, the, 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 the numbers being quite low is that if you take a vaccine, it's going to help you, it's going to protect you against getting the virus, but it's also going to protect your grandma and it's going to protect your great auntie and it's going to protect people that are at high risk if enough people are vaccinated. And so 50% in the country won't cut it. We really need something more like 90% if we're going to make this go away. Uh, and so I, I hope that through education, we can help people become confident and comfortable. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I had my flu shot and I will say that when that vaccine's ready, I'm in line for it. Me too. Uh, I want to say you know, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Foster. I oh, it's my pleasure. 
our conversations. I really do. And we all appreciate the confidence building guidance around how to think and talk about the up there's and down there's again, cognition, energy, and mood, as well as bowel, bladder, and sexual function with our own doctors. Let's yeah. get the confidence to be able to do that. And I really appreciate you spending some time on even how to address these issues with our loved ones who may not fully understand. I'm Mary Ray, co-founder of my MS team. Thank you all for being here with us today. The information and support doesn't stop here. If you already are a member of my MS team, please share the helpful advice you got today with other members in the activity feed. If you'd like to become a member, just go to mymsteam.com and sign up for free. Remember, you're not alone. I hope to see you at our next event with Dr. Boster on January 21st. It's a Thursday when we discuss the many questions surrounding COVID-19 and MS. We'll, we'll extend this conversation and discuss new information about how the vaccines may affect people with MS. The link to register for the event is right here in the chat. Thank you again. And Dr. Boster, we'll see you next time. Thank you guys. Have a great night.